Hey all, welcome to Share Trek. Today I want to address a philosophical aspect with you guys because most of you uh, are acutely aware uh, that research is going on, especially for gene-based medicines. And uh, we have already seen that the sickle cell disease medicine was around uh, 2.1 million for CASJV from CRISPR therapeutics. And uh, the Bluebird Bio uh, Life Genia for sickle cell disease, again, another gene therapy, is um, priced at 3.1 million. So with these kind of prices, uh, it's really scary to uh, contemplate what a HIV therapy would cost. Uh, so I'm, I'm making this video today to give you my opinion based on my understanding of uh, the genomic uh, companies that I review for, from a financial aspect. Uh, I look at it from the point of view of uh, shares and investment. And I also study their profitability and pricing. So I have got a little insight into how things work. So I wanted to share that with you uh, to give you guys an idea of what is happening right now and what's likely to be the uh, things going on in the back end as we come closer to monetization of gene therapies. And um, uh, I hope you find this interesting. And you can always put your questions around pricing in the comments below and I'll try and uh, answer it uh, if I feel confident. Otherwise, I'll search for answers and get back to you. With that said, I would say that uh, pricing is a very, very important aspect uh, for uh, pharmaceutical industry and uh, genomics industry. The reason being that uh, if you take the case of pharma industry, already uh, pharma industry is mature. Uh, they have had uh, decades of producing medicines which had um, uh, intellectual property rights for a couple of decades for each of those machine uh, medicines. And at the end of those uh, uh, patent periods, uh, the pharmaceutical companies started coming up with additional use for uh, that medicine. For example, if uh, a medicine was initially approved for heart disease, they would come up with uh, another use for the same medicine. Uh, and if that is approved, then they get an extension of the patent. And they put the approval for the new use just uh, two years before the end of the previous patent. And that way they can extend the patent. On the other hand, if the patent expired, what would happen is that the generics manufacturer would all be able to uh, take the formulation and start manufacturing it and selling it at a cheaper price. Whenever a therapy goes um, generic, the price drops significantly because there are many manufacturers who are trying to make it at the same time. And all of them want to be able to sell so they start pricing it low for competition. So initially the price doesn't go that low, but then uh, after the uh, product is released and after some cost is recovered, the generics start competing with each other and drive the price down. In the process, many of the generic manufacturers might move out of a particular therapy because there isn't enough profit worth uh, putting the efforts to manufacture. So as they move away, you have uh, uh, one or two companies remaining and the last one standing would probably have uh, beneficial use of that medicine and then they start increasing the price and when they increase the price somebody else comes in until the mar margin stays low. So after some point of time when other uh, more effective medicine uh, come in or more profitable uh, patents become generic, uh, these manufacturers moves, move to that and sometimes it so happens that a successful uh, drug uh, which was under patent and was expensive for a couple of decades after becoming generic after a point of time you may find that it's not available anymore in generic and at the same time it will be even more expensive with the original manufacturer because they don't have the scales to distribute the cost and maintain the infrastructure to keep manufacturing those medicines so in a way going uh, generic uh, sometimes could be bad for the uh, medicine from the point of view of availability and pricing and in a way, going generic also is beneficial to the public because it can become very, very inexpensive. So this is one aspect that I would like you to keep in mind. Then comes the question of government intervention uh, to keep the prices low. The best case we have is under the Inflation Reduction Act, insulin has been uh, limited at $35. So I wouldn't uh, say that it's a bad decision by the government because diabetic patients need insulin on an ongoing basis. And insulin particularly uh, has been, uh, it's a hormone which has been uh, synthetic and synthesized many, many decades ago. 
and I think the cost and everything has already been recovered. So uh, I don't think $35 uh, a dose is going to kill the industry as such. People will continue to manufacture and supply uh, insulin. But then when we look at things like AGT 103-T and EBT 101, uh, things like that, when they come into the market, that's a different ball game altogether. Those are gene companies. Now, staying with the pharma companies, if you take a step further, there are pharma companies which have produced a lot of ART uh, uh, medicines for uh, for the people. And uh, these are the likes of Cabotogravir and um, uh, the lots that we have spoken about, uh, transcriptase inhibitors and uh, ca capsid maturity inhibitors and so on and so forth, which is a cocktail that is given so that you can control HIV virus and keep it at very low levels, uh, almost undetectable levels. And these have to be given to patients on a regular basis. And of course, progress is being made there also to reduce the dosage frequency. And we have gone all the way up to, I think, uh, once every two months, and they are trying to work out their way towards once a year. So once the clinical trials are over, we may get the verdict. But within what is approved as ART for a daily basis, many governments have stepped in. Many philanthropic organizations have stepped in and uh, they have subsidized uh, the medicine to a great extent in many countries. Mm -hmm. And also uh, there is an initiative which gets all these medicines uh, at a cheaper price on a patent uh, to lesser developed countries so that the pharmaceutical companies within those uh, countries can manufacture it at a low cost basis uh, because those countries cannot afford that kind of uh, therapy. So those activities are already in place. For example, in India, Cabotogravir has been um, uh, licensed for uh, subsidized manufacture. And I think uh, Arabindo Pharma and Sipla are two companies which are licensed to do that. Of course, they'll have to go through the local uh, approval from the local drug authority in their respective countries. And uh, it takes a little time to ramp up the production, but once the production starts, it's way cheaper than what you would find uh, from the original manufacturer. Uh, all this costs the manufacturer uh, profit margins. Now, if you look at a typical um, healthcare company, uh, it's run by shareholders. Shareholders um, invest their money and they are looking for a return. If they don't get a decent return, they will take their money and go elsewhere. There are very, very few shareholders who are philosophical and would stay with a pharmaceutical company, who would stay invested in a pharmaceutical company if it does not give them the returns that is needed. And to be honest, many of the people who invest in stock market, especially in the Western nations, are doing so because the interest rates in the banks are very low. And in the past, companies used to give a defined uh, benefit uh, kind of um, pensions where uh, people would get 70% of the benefits that they were getting while they were working or 80% or even 100% of the benefits. Uh, so yeah, when they left the work, it was not like they had lost a lot of income. The company was taking care of them. But then over the decades, things started changing and became defined contribution, which means you are responsible to save a portion of your salary every month for your pension and then uh, you have to multiply that uh, by taking decisions on which funds it will be invested in and where it will be put in. And if it loses value, it's your fault. If it, uh, if it grows, it's uh, good for you. So uh, when people used to retire, they just had those things and maybe a little bit of social security, which is being eroded over a period of time. Uh, so that's the reason why in the Western countries, in advanced economies, people are more uh, prone to invest in the stock market because nowhere else can they get any return. And when they invest in stock market, they are looking at dividends so that they can expect a fixed sum of money every month so that they can put bread and butter on the table and take care of their golden years. So that's the motivation behind it. It's not pure greed. And then there are people who are purely greedy, like the pharma bro who bought a company to jack up the price for a medicine. Uh, so that's an extreme case. We don't find those kind of cases very often. So when the government comes in and puts a ceiling or cap on top of uh, the price for any uh, therapy, uh, what happens is that uh, the company loses its margin. And when it loses its margin, it will reduce the dividends. So if the company starts losing shareholders, its share prices will uh, price will drop. 
and it will find it difficult to raise capital. It will have to borrow money at a higher interest rate and um, it, it will be unable to put money for further research and development to create new therapies to replace the old ones. And once their patent is gone, anyway, it will become generic and they wouldn't be able to make money out of it. That's why many pharmaceutical companies want to take out the money as soon as possible so they price their drugs high so that they can recover their costs and also potential dividends for their um, investors. So this is the dynamic that operates behind it. Not all investors are bad, not all pharmaceutical companies are bad, and um, this is the dynamic. Now, if governments decide to be ruthless and decide to cut down, now we have the something called as Inflation Redu Redu Reduction Act uh, in the US. Uh, under Inflation Reduction Act, there was a court case recently in, um, I think in Delaware, where uh, AstraZeneca was fighting uh, the government uh, regarding negotiation of price by Medicare. So the uh, the court said that you are you are not obligated to go and negotiate with them. You can sell to anybody that you want. You you are you are not forced to go and negotiate with the government. And the judge also said at the same time, uh, you also should acknowledge that if you go and negotiate with the government, you get exposure to a whole lot of um, patients at once. You get uh, access to a huge market which you otherwise would have to spend uh, advertising and other means to uh, reach them. So the judge said, I'm not going to uh, stop this process. Medicare can go ahead and negotiate uh, bulk drug prices and put a lid on the price. Uh, it will benefit the retirees and others who are under Medicare. So I agree uh, to that sentiment as well because it's a free market and uh, everybody should, the demand and supply should match each other. So when I look at it from an investment perspective, because remember, I have got the investment channel where I'm looking at it purely from the point of view of uh, profitability, share price, margins, and so on. And the HIV side, I'm looking at it from the patient's perspective and from the perspective of a healthcare provider. Uh, of course, I'm not a doctor and uh, I don't understand the intricacies of uh, how HIV operates on people and uh, how the med medical system works, etc., etc. But philosophically, I'm, I'm thinking that if I was a patient for any ailment, how would I look at the pricing of drug that cures or controls or provides relief for that ailment? So I would always want cheaper price. I would always want easy availability and preferably I would like to get it free. So this is the other extreme of uh, the stakeholder uh, in this whole system. So who are the stakeholders out here? The shareholder is a stakeholder. Uh, then uh, the company management is another stakeholder. The workers in the company are also stakeholders because imagine you have good scientists and you've got good uh, people working in a company. They need to have growth. They need to have bonuses. They need to have salaries. They need to educate their kids. Uh, they have their own expenses. They have aspirations for their career and their life. So can we ask them to suspend all of those things by putting a cap on the price uh, and keeping a very low price for the drugs? If that happens, they would not be able to do any more research and development and as a result of which scientists would not be able to get uh, a job that pays a decent salary. And the result of that would be that uh, students will not go into uh, genomics or into pharmaceutical uh, uh, education and there will be a dearth of people getting into it. And if that happens, then the companies will have to pay a premium to attract and retain the scarce number of uh, people who have that skill set, and that is going to drive the cost of the therapy up. And all this will not happen immediately. This will take 10 to 20 years to happen. By that time, it will be too late to do any correction, and the only correction that will be happening is through higher prices that you pay for, uh, for the medicines. Uh, and um, on the other hand, uh, if in developing countries which cannot afford and the underdeveloped countries which cannot afford high price for these therapies, if you don't give them medicine, especially for HIV, then HIV can really spread across the globe and it will become even more difficult to control. So the administrators, the governing bodies and uh, lawmakers and everybody uh, have all the stakeholders have to get together and be reasonable with each other and try to come to a nice equilibrium where it's a win-win for everybody and we get rid of this menace of HIV. And especially when you're looking at the next generation medicine, now I'm going into gene therapy where we're looking at AJT103-T 
and EBT 101. These are all therapies which are at the cutting edge. When I say cutting edge, that means the means used for production of these therapies are brand new and they are very, very expensive because they are not to scale. And uh, as a result of which, uh, the setup itself is very expensive and the cost of the setup is going to be recovered from the sales price of the therapy. So first, the setup is very expensive. Second, the talent that is needed for this cutting edge research is top of the line talent and they have to pay top of the line salary to be retained or else they'll go to a competition company which is also working on same kind of therapy. So that competition means that you have to retain really good employees by paying them good salary. And where does that salary come from? The cost of the therapy. It's all sunken cost into the therapy while it goes through clinical trials. And when it goes through clinical trials, the company has to subsidize treatment of maybe 100, 200 or 300 patients for the whole duration of the clinical trial, which could be uh, as low as three years to as high as 10 or 15 years. So it's a lot of commitment, a lot of money being poured into it. And there's a risk premium also out there. What if a therapy goes through for another four years or something and then fails? All that money is gone. So the investor who is taking the risk uh, is going to demand a high return uh, for, for the investment. So all these dynamics work uh, uh, at the back of it when it comes to leading edge therapies uh, like uh, AGT-103 and um, uh, EBT-101. So you have to keep in mind that it's not going to be inexpensive when these therapies come into the market. And um, this is going to be the biggest test of uh, humanity in the sense that how much do you value life and how much do you value money? Uh, it's, it's the comparison that's being done. But then I would add another dimension to it. I would say that if you look at uh, the ART that is already available and the frequency that is being uh, decreased so that you have less dosing, all those things are giving an option which is affordable and viable. And therefore, people who can afford the gene therapies may be the ones who first get the opportunity to go for once and done functional care. And those people will get it first. And then as the companies start recovering their money, uh, they would be able to agree to some kind of deal with World Health Organization or big philanthropic organizations uh, to sell them a bulk of uh, the product so that it can be distributed by those organizations in a subsidized manner to lesser developed countries and underdeveloped countries and areas which cannot afford. So this is the way I think the rolling out of gene therapies for HIV might uh, come to be. Uh, so if I, if I was to uh, try to imagine what the pricing regime would be like if uh, any of these gene therapies get approved, I would say that the first thing that I would um, uh, look at is that at that point of time, I visualize that we would probably have ART, which is once in six months dosage or once in a year dosage. That would happen simultaneously or just before uh, gene therapy, which is once and done for HIV. And as a result of that, you will have the cheapest being daily ART, which will be almost uh, absolutely free or almost uh, cheap, uh, so cheap that uh, people would not worry too much about it. And then the next one, which is going to be a little more expensive, will be the once in six months. And after that, there'll be once in a year, which will be a, a little more expensive. And the most expensive of all would be the gene therapy. And the gene therapies will become less expensive probably in another 10 or 15 years after they get introduced. That is my, uh, that's my personal opinion uh, based on everything I have seen in the business so far. Uh, and um, when it comes to gene therapy pricing, I'm just doing uh, a, a forecasting based on my own estimates because we haven't seen many gene therapies uh, in the market which have been around for 10 years or something. But we have seen some which have been around for five years or six years, but most of them have been less than $100,000. Uh, but I haven't seen anything which is in the millions of dollars uh, for five or 10 years. So this is just a speculation on my part. So friends, I think that uh, there will be uh, much more superior therapies that will be available. And we have come a long way since uh, when AIDS was uh, identified to be caused by HIV. And then HIV therapies started getting created. And when research started since then, uh, the world has come a long way. 
and with the the ART that we have right now and the kind of control that it gives and new ART that is in the pipeline I think uh, things are just going to look better as we go ahead but I wanted to take the opportunities to give you a reality check in terms of what I think is likely to be the pricing regime uh, you may have a lot of questions please put your questions in the comments below and I'll try to answer you the answer give you some answers and again, uh, this video, like all of our other videos, will become subtitled in a 10 to 12 different languages. And it takes me an hour or so after the video is released um, to be able to create those subtitles. And sometimes when I record a video late, like this video is being recorded at 10.30 p.m. in Toronto. So I will get to it in the next morning. So sometimes a day later, you will find uh, the subtitles. So as a policy, all English videos in this channel will have subtitles in multiple languages. So if you do not find your language in there, please let me know and I'll see if it is feasible. I get a statistic of how many people are watching uh, in different languages. Based on that, I introduce uh, the languages. So I don't think any of you will find it lacking. But just in case, mention it in the comments and I'll take it from there. Thanks and have a great day. I'm sorry it was a, big, a bit long, but uh, I had to do this video. Bye for now. Enjoy your weekend.